Hi everyone, welcome to this session. I'm pleased to introduce Dan uh, Kernaghan and Tim Kraytak. Dan is the Pitney Bro Bowes Big Data Solutions Evangelist, working directly with the Spectrum Big Data products to build a spatial and address quality solutions for our customers in North America. Uh, Tim Kraytak is the CEO of Ironside, having led Ironside from its inception and helped it become a leader in the North American analytics community, including multiple years honored on the Inc. 5000. They will be presenting a talk titled Strategies for Applying Location to Virtually Any Data. Please join me in welcoming Dan and Tim. Thank you. <coughs> So I don't know how many of you know about Pitney Bowes, but to me right now, it really doesn't matter. What I'd like to ask is how many of you work with GIS applications today? Because I'm here to pick a fight with most of you. At Pitney Bowes, a lot of people know us by our mailing business, but what we've been able to do is take that mailing business and the precision associated with the address and turn it into a location intelligence software suite, which about three years ago we ported to big data in the form of SDKs. And, and we provide software for spatial processing and some pretty cool spatial processing. I'd like, I'd encourage each one of you to stop by our booth out here uh, this afternoon. Let me show you what we've got, as well as geocoding, address validation, and routing. Um, we also have a big presence in the data market. So we're a data aggregator with 1,400 specifically curated data sets that cover streets, boundaries, uh, property attributes, and demographics uh, in ways that, although you may be consuming that kind of data today, I, I think we can provide a level of accuracy and precision that extends beyond what you're doing. Uh, chances are if you're not using Pitney Bowes today. And then, and then we have a services organization. So we've leveraged what we know about addresses to build out a location and awareness worldwide. And by partnering that data with our software, we're capable of providing some pretty, pretty strong big data uh, applications and solutions. Um, I like to say every address has a location, but, but not every location has an address. So, what I mean by that is if you've worked with other GIS solutions that are focused on location, we bring a fresh perspective because, because of our heritage, we focus on address, okay? <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you about three trends that we've seen since big data has kind of moved into this space over the last three years. And they're pretty big trends, right? The first one being a change in the way that we process GIS data on Hadoop. And, and when I say, I'm saying Hadoop, but I really mean you know, Hadoop, Docker, ephemeral images on cloud, what, you know, anything, we do DCOS. You know, so, so I'm gonna, if it's okay with you, just kind of lump all that into a Hadoop conversation, okay? Um, but, Rather than store the data and then use specialized GIS functions as they're read, taking a lot of time, having a performance penalty on read, what we choose to do is use that big data solution to pre-process the GIS components ahead of time. So rather than using a traditional database with GIS functions, instead, you process the data using the spatial functions up front. We like to say turning a two-dimensional spatial problem into a one-dimensional location address, right? Pretty simple, pretty easy, and once you get the hang of it, you'll realize that uh, with, with big data, you're no longer afraid of a billion rows anymore, right? It just doesn't matter. <clears throat> the other one is organizing that data in a way that makes it useful, right? We've been doing lat long as primary keys in data for years, right? There are challenges with that, and anyone that's tried to do it understands that juggling two highly precise latitude longitudes for every location can get a little challenging. On the other side, 
it also represents an, a location, not an address. So I can get you a point in space with a latitude, longitude very easily. But what we found over the years is there are other ways that give you a little bit more precision that are easier to work with, right? The right geo hash level 10 is what? 11 centimeter square at the equator, right? That's pretty precise. And because it's hierarchical, it's easy to use as a key, it's easy to partition, easy to deploy, right? But, but the trend that we're seeing, and, and if you've been working with data in this area, you've seen this before, is vendors now starting to introduce their own keys. So Pitney Bowes has one too. It's not complicated. <coughs> Essentially, we build a base 36 number, we call it a PB key. We guarantee its uniqueness. We guarantee its persistence. We guarantee its hierarchy so that it's easy to use and easy to deploy. Make sense? And by doing that, you've now opened up the world to leveraging location data that's now easy to access, easy to join, with anything else that you have in your organization. For example, taking location data and, and a, a temporal element allows you to march through details about uh, context, behaviors, et cetera, in, in data science, right? Uh, combining that location and address with a user profile. This is very popular for us, by the way. Knowing somebody's Twitter handle or Facebook login is great, right? But knowing the location or address where that behavior is taking place is becoming more and more important as we go forward. And by leveraging the, the location data we provide, with, with these sorts of additional facets, uh, you can drill down quite a bit using the data science algorithms you're already using today. <coughs> By the way, while I'm here, <coughs> one of the things we like to talk about, because we provide those 1,400 data sets, is if you give me an address, I can return to you 9,100 attributes that describe that address. I can tell you the fire zone, the flood zone, how far it is to the nearest hospital, how far it is to the nearest fire station, what the roof composition is, how many bedrooms. That's the easy stuff, right? But I can also tell you whether it's in a neighborhood that is in economic decline or an economic resurgence. I can bring detailed demographics to express exactly what's going on with that particular address. And I can do it all because We've processed it ahead of time. We know the boundaries. We essentially know what school district you're in and what HOA you're in. And, and I've keyed them all together on a common key that's persistent and unique. <clears throat> and then the, the last trend that, that we've seen is, is the push toward cloud native. I, I came from cloud era a few years ago. I like to do I still enjoy working with it. I still enjoy the power and capability that that distributed processing brings. However, uh, even, the, even the disruptors get disrupted. And I spend more time today working with ephemeral clusters on Amazon or Google Cloud, and, uh, and I'm cool with that, Databricks. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, uh, being able to support uh, the real-time elastic. So through our SDKs, we've also been able to deploy microservices that do the geocoding, the spatial processing, the routing, uh, and they're very fast. 10 millisecond uh, US validated address and geocode from a, from a microservice is actually, that's usable, right? Um, so what we've done is we've pulled this data together in a meaningful way so that now you have this pool, it's called a spatial data lake, with billions of rows, all describing addresses worldwide, available for you to do pretty much anything you need to do. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, Tim, who, who's an expert at doing something with that massive amount of data. All right, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it very much. So I understood most of what Dan just said. Um, and from my perspective, um, 
my role in the conversation as a, as a partner, an implementation partner with Pitney Bowes is helping you take advantage of all this capability, of all this data, and apply it to problems in your business. So, you know, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time and try to, try to make this, have this make sense. Um, you know, from our perspective, um, these are the capabilities of my firm, Ironside. We're gonna focus in the middle on sort of data science, machine learning, and then data quality and third party data enrichment, right? Everybody has first party data. There's a lot of third party data out there and the data sets, the 500 unique, 4,000 persistent data sets all tied together with this PB key make it really interesting and easy to apply combine Pitney's third-party data with your internal first-party data for the purposes of enabling, enriching um, your data sets to have more meaningful machine learning models, have more meaningful outcomes, and have a better impact on your business. So, so what is data science? Um, you know, the, sort of the depth of, of Dan's component here, um, the depth of some of the things you're talking about, um, you know, goes really deep. Ultimately, my goal here in this conversation is to talk to you about how to apply it, how to use it, how to explain it to people, because there, there's a lot of sort of, there's a lot of misnomers out there. Um, from my perspective, it's just basically using data to inform and automate decision making in pursuit of better business outcomes. Very simply, that's why we're here. We want to make things more efficient, we want to leverage data, and we want to improve, uh, improve business outcomes. Really core applications of data science, you can really group these into three high level areas. Grow your revenue, have more sales. Maximize efficiency, do things cheaper, do things faster, better interact with your customers more efficiently, um, inform both your employees and your customers, and then understand and minimize risk. There's a lot of applications Pitney Bowes has deployed very often in insurance risk cases. We've talked about flood, we've talked about distance, distance to fire stations, distance to flood zones. Sort of, sort of all of those concepts applied to your first party data allow you to be more effective in, in doing these three things. But at the end of it all, data science is a, is a means for business process optimization. How much or how many? Count, simple, right? How do we group them together? Affinity. What category? What classification? Which one of these is not like the others? What are the outliers? What are the things that we need to look at? What, what might be fraud, for instance, in a financial uh, you know, transaction situation? And then what action? What should I do about it? So I understand that something's gonna happen. I can predict that an event in a business or an action, you know, sort of uh, uh, an event in a business is gonna happen. And then how do I affect the outcome? Whether it's in a situation like customer churn, I know that this particular set of my customers is going to churn from my business and how do I affect that? What, what are the factors, what are the features, what are the things that I can do and affect to prevent that person from leaving me as a customer? Or you know, taking, their, taking some of their assets out of my institution from a financial perspective. Uh, or go to someone else from an insurance perspective policy wise. For us it's really all about use cases. So um, where, do we, where do we apply data science how, where do we start? How do we think about it? It's really, you know, most, most people here, most people in, in business, um, they start on the right. They start with what data do I have? And then how do I leverage this? How do I apply AI to this business problem? You know, they, they work from right to left. From our perspective, we think you should always be working from left to right, right? What, what is your outcome? What is the business use case that you want to affect? What, whether it's, I want more customers, or I want to keep my customers, or I want to increase my profitability. You know, what are the, and then what are the activities that will lead to success? What will prevent it? What is the opportunity? Then what are all of the decisions and actions that are going to lead to that business outcome? What's the analysis? Who wants to know who can affect it? And then ultimately, what's the data? And then the third piece in leveraging Pitney's data is what are the external data sets that I can use to enrich my first party data to help me with this process? So those are, those are the thought processes, that's the methodology that we work through with our customers, and it's a really good way to get started, to get started thinking, to get started educating people on how to leverage AI and data science in decision making in your business. So, so we've talked about enriching your data with external data. So uh, Dan mentioned uh, address, uh, 9,100 um, uh, attributes of a single address, um, Dan mentioned 
uh, a person and tying together a physical address with an online persona, a digital and physical, when you start, start imagining, if I can do that, if I know someone is praising my product or my service you know, on Twitter or Facebook, uh, or someone's detracting from it, and I can figure out where they are, I have the ability to actually impact that, right? One, I know what it is, I tie those things together, and then proactively on the other side, putting those pieces of information together, I can more effectively market, I can more effectively acquire customers, I can more effectively communicate. So what else about the consumer outside of my first part of data you know, correlates to value for them and value to us as a business? How does traffic and drive time impact our access to the market both broadly and individually? So um, Dan mentioned uh, the Pitney Bowes data, the ability to understand uh, drive time, that there is points of interest information. So uh, for instance, one of our customers is a, um, a franchise fitness chain, right? So thinking about sort of how do they do site selection. Where do I decide to put my next fitness franchise, right? You know, when I look at the, the United States. And, and factors that are gonna come in are socioeconomic, uh, what other gyms are in that location, how many people live there, how likely are they to go to the gym, how likely are they to wanna pay to go to the gym, like all of those types of pieces of information. All of these data sets that we've talked about feed into those analysis, analyses and, and those types of decisions. Um, how do elements such as weather impact performance of our product and services? So weather data is another component that has gonna have a, a pretty big impact. Um, we, um, we did a project, uh, which, which I'll talk about a little bit, with um, the Manchester, New Hampshire Police Department. And what we did was we took all their historical crime data, we took their weather data, and we actually created a probability of crime happening. So we helped them predict where crime was gonna happen. We deployed that in a cruiser, so they actually have a map of the city with essentially red, green, yellow uh, of where crime is likely to happen. And they actually, they affect their patrol routes based upon the analytics, the prediction, and then all the historical data. And the really interesting thing about that is that actually changed significantly the way they run their business, their culture around data, the way they collected information, the care they put into it. You know, I had a really interesting example. I had one of my employees that happened to live in that city and uh, he had his car parked and he had a GPS in his car. The car was broken into and the GPS was stolen. This was uh, two or three years ago. And the uh, first question is, is who has a GPS anymore, right? Everybody's got phones. I don't even know they make them. Um, the second question was, so, so he called in to report the crime and, and the, the police dispatcher on the other side said, okay, I, I need a lot more information because we have this new system where we're predicting where crime is gonna happen. And he, so, so essentially, the, he was sort of a, a consumer of the benefit of the data collection and the change in the thought process around actually identifying, keeping this information because it would make the predictions uh, more effective and more valuable on a go-forward basis. What if I could estimate the customer's affluence and spending power before they ever transact, transact with me? So sort of, sort of all of these things that, that we've talked about, and, and this goes into geodemographics, it goes into education, it goes into propensity and then ultimately feeds into models that create propensity to buy models. Um, and, and as Dan mentioned, uh, with big data, you know, we can pre-score all of these attributes. So in some situations, when you call in, when you, when you go to an app to, to uh, get a new sort of insurance policy for your home or for your car, um, there's a good degree of likelihood that they already know who you are, they know about the property. You know, they may ask you some information, but at the end of it all, they're not using the information you provide because they don't actually trust it. They go to third-party data sources. They pre-score every address in the United States uh, in the case of a homeowner's policy so that they can give you an accurate quote. If they quote you based upon, every, every, everybody wants something now. The problem is, is the validity and the veracity of the data that you provide them as a consumer isn't necessarily what they're gonna use to underwrite an insurance policy. So if they can more effectively provide you with a quote that accurately represents what it would cost them to, to insure that property um, based upon the pre-processing, all of the information that, that, uh, that, that we've mentioned, um, you're gonna have a better interaction with them as a business. The, the opposite is if they take all of your information and you say I have three, you know, three bedrooms and two baths and, and you know, I don't have a swimming pool and, and you know, I'm not near a flood zone, right? And they give you a, a price of, say, $5,000 a year. And then, and then they go back and check on all those things, and it turns out that the price is 
$15,000 a year, you're going to say that you know, this company is not someone who I want to do business with because it's bait and switch. But at the end of the day, you didn't give them the right information on the front end, so they couldn't provide you a valid quote. These solutions allow us to enable our customers to, to more accurately assess and price opportunities based upon all of this third-party data. So competitors, points of, inf points of interest. Um, so we talked about the franchise fitness model and where do I put a particular, um, you know, wh where do I think about putting a new location for my franchise? Um, knowing what other fitness facilities, what other, you know, from a points of interest perspective, are, are going to be between me and the location that I'm thinking about putting my, my new franchise model, um, you know, is really interesting information and, and it's pretty impactful. So if I'm going to drive past five gyms before I get to this franchise, very likely I'm not going to. I'm not going to join unless you, know, you make it really cheap or, or really, really exciting in, in some other way. And then the last point here is, would I interact differently with a given consumer with this information at the outset? I think that's the really interesting point is, the more you know about the person that you're interfacing with from a business perspective, the more effectively you can make offers to them. The more effectively you can understand what's important. And you know, there's a little bit of big brother, but at the end of the day, this information is available publicly. This information is available from you know, third party, um, it's like Pitney, and, and you, know, you, you really have a, an ability to positively impact uh, your customer satisfaction, your, your marketing, your offers, and, and everything else. So I want to talk a little bit about um, one particular uh, opportunity. You guys have all heard of Airbnb, correct? So, so this, this use case is really focused on Airbnb. So I have an apartment in downtown Boston. I live in Boston, by the way. Um, what, what this is really focused on is if I want to rent my apartment out this summer for visitors that are coming in to, to visit, what are the factors that are going to have that make sense and what can I expect to happen in terms of the average price and you know, the, the um, the average price in the number of days in a month that I, I should expect to um, have my apartment rented, right? Because that may affect, do I buy a vacation home? Do I move? Do I, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so we took uh, about 1,000 listings in greater Boston. The assumptions that we had from an Airbnb perspective were 100% of those visitors left a review. We want to know, like, what apartments are the most likely to rent for the highest price, right? That's sort of the business use case. Um, an average stay. The price listed is the average daily price. The availability for the summer months does not change year over year. So we're going to actually use historical data to understand what are the features, what are the attributes of the particular properties that make them more likely to be rentable. The filters, um, there, were, there were bookings, so it wasn't a new property. It had bookings in 17 and 18 and had availability. And then the address could be enriched. And this is sort of how, how the Pitney Bowes uh, you know, component of this sort of feeds into this particular use case. Is, is the 9,100 pro property attributes that, that Dan mentioned. <clears throat> so property type, map, max number of people, number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, the bed type, the room type, the property description, the text, the neighborhood description, the amenities. So this is actually what you'd read off of the Airbnb website. The host attributes. Obviously, if you've used Airbnb, you know I've used it. I look for a super host because that gives me a higher level of confidence that that property is going to be what it says it is. Um, kind of like in a hotel, you might look for a Marriott or a Hilton because you know, you know what you're going to get. You know, if there's a no-name brand or if it's a, it's a smaller brand that you're not familiar with, you're not likely to understand what it is you're going to get. It's the same thing, again, with, with Airbnb. So the, 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 the binary the host is or isn't a super host, is there a picture available? Is there prior reviews? Is the host local? Is the host in the same neighborhood? You know, so these are all attributes that we understand. And, and actually play into the likelihood of someone actually renting that particular property for a higher dollar amount for a higher number of days. Host description, policies, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that, you know, from my perspective, as I look for an Airbnb, if I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to travel for business, these are the things that I'm going to play in, I'm going to think about. So these features come from third party, right? So distance to nearest public transit. So how, how close is the subway? How close is the bus line? How close is the airport? The cameo segment, that's a sort of demographic information of people that live in that particular property in, the, in that area. The financial stress, the presence of children, the population of city block, households in the city block, and then history. Summer availability. How many days 
our mark is available as we sort of lead into that particular area, and then also 16 and 17 summer, summer revenue. So what we did was we took sort of those data sets and all of that information, we fed it into an automated machine learning platform uh, from a technology called Data Robot. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of them, but uh, you know, we, we work very closely with them. We think that they're, um, they make it much easier to apply all of these data sets and your first party data into solving problems. And, and the feature importance is in, in terms of what is the highest degree of likelihood that someone's going to rent my property. So the 100% is, did it rent last year, right? So, so the, the highest people that rented last year are more likely to, to, to rent this year. So that actually makes sense, right? You know, the properties that were attractive to people last year and are on the market again are also gonna be attractive to people this year. The second thing is scores based upon the text feature. So this is actually the description, the summary in the description. Um, the location closest to the, the airport, right? You know, you, you might think about that, but you might not think of it as sort of the third highest indicator of whether or not that that's gonna be rented or not rented on a particular day. Um, scores based upon the neighborhood overview, the nearest Amtrak station, the room type accommodates, location data, um, block population density, block socioeconomic, they, they, they surfaced as the most important predictors of the summer demand. And again, you can sort of dig into this and understand sort of about that question. From what we did with Data Robot was we fed this into the model. Um, it, what Data Robot does is it automatically tests 50 models from a performance perspective. So, it, so it, it, it actually tells you which is the most likely model to predict the outcome that you want. It balances performance and accuracy. It, it's intensive cross-validation and it allows manual retraining if you have insight that it's not telling you, right? So, so if you have a data science background, you understand the scientific process attached to it, you can actually affect it. The analogy I use with a tool like Data Robot is it's kind of like a digital SLR camera. You can be a really amateur photographer and take great pictures with a DSLR camera, like a Canon Rebel or something like that. Um, but if you're, a really, if you're a professional photographer, you can use that technology and even, even take better pictures, right? I'm an amateur photographer, my son is more of a professional photographer and he likes to remind me of that as often as he can. <laughs> so anyway, um, the bottom line is, is that you know, with that particular use case, um, location and, and the, the, the relative, um, where the property was relative to other geographic assets and the locations and the travel times had a major impact on whether or not that particular property was to be um, you know, likely to be rented. So this is a different type of use case, and again, also uh, deployed in, in Data Robot, um, and it's essentially a, a retail loyalty program. And, and what we did was we tried to understand from a retail store leveraging location, what are the drivers of, uh, what are the drivers of how likely someone is to come in and, and shop at my retail store? And, and from a, you know, a lot of times customers, you, you, you may have, if, if you have a, a card, like a supermarket card or a, a, a department store card, they, they know who you are. Um, but when you think about, you know, the further, no, no matter what you do, and, if, and you can't really read the, the different attributes here, but ultimately the conclusion of this analysis was that the number one factor, the number one feature that tells us if you're likely to come in and spend money is how far you are away from our store. It doesn't matter what coupons we give you, it doesn't matter what ads we run, at the end of the day, the closer you are, the more likely you are to come. So if I'm gonna spend money or I'm gonna issue discounts or coupons, it's, I, I need to know that it's most, most the, the most important feature determining whether or not someone's gonna come spend money with me is how far they are away. Right, which is pretty logical and it kind of makes sense, right? So this is, this is something, sometimes what happens with data science and machine learning use cases is it tells you stuff that you already know, but you're proving it, right? And that's the benefit of it. From our perspective, this is derived from accurate geocoder and address information, and, and really the, the most impactful model feature was this particular, uh, was that, that, that distance from a geography perspective. Um, you know, from our perspective, when you think about analytics maturity, a lot of folks um, approach it and, and they take the approach of, um, I buy a tool, doesn't matter what it is, or I use a tool like R or Python, I buy a tool like Data Robot or H2O or SPSS or SageMaker from AWS or you know, Google or whatever the case may be, and then I hire smart people. 
right? And at the end of it all, it's really about, you know, that's, domain knowledge is probably one of the more important aspects of this. So what do you know about your business? What do you know about the data that exists in your business? And, and you know, the skills and the tools, right? Again, data robots, something that we work with very closely. We think that's a good, good platform for that. So the domain knowledge and the analytics schools, and, and then essentially broader and more complete and accurate data. So, so taking third-party data, enriching your internal data, really allow you to get to um, better analytical use cases and better analytical outcomes. And you know, from our perspective, we, we approach it with helping you to combine all these things together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some specific use cases that, that we've done in, in my business. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Dan to join me to, to, to talk about a little bit in the sense of sort of, if we had leveraged more concepts from Pitney, from the third party data, you know, how, how would they be better? Like how could we improve these sort of analytical use cases? Um, so the first one is where should I locate officers to prevent crime? I talked about that a little bit earlier, right? Um, do, do you wanna join me here? I, I think you can probably, uh, is there, you have the microphone, right? So we've talked about this use case with uh, law enforcement um, a little bit, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's crime data and weather data. Th those are really the two data sets that we have. Um, and I've worked projects here before and, and surprisingly found there are, there are a lot of other factors that impact that, right? Um, I worked with a municipality in Texas where we also brought in code compliance cases, animal control cases, human health and resource cases, uh, several other cases to help also provide predictors of exactly that, where first responders are most likely to be needed and, and how quickly they have to get there. All right, excellent. Um, next one was a retailer. So in this particular store is like, what store should I open or close to, to maximize profits? This was a clothing store. Um, they, they wanted to know sort of losses and fraud and, and, and um, you know, they wanted to know sort of what led to um, sort of negative outcomes in their business um, and then which store should I open and close to maximize profits? Any, any thoughts around location yeah. or? Yeah, and, and location's very important. Mostly the demographics that's tied to the specific addresses within a catchment area of that retailer, right? That's, that's very important. And, and it turns out we've done a lot of work around that in, in using the routing engine to identify highly precise catchment areas based on drive time around specific locations, and then using that to also identify the economic vitality of the neighborhood, whether it's increasing, decreasing, um, and how close they are to neighborhoods that might have a higher economic vitality figure. And then the number of competitors that are there, the number of uh, complementary businesses you ever wonder why you see a Walgreens and a CBS on the same corner? Ask them. They actually make more money when they're across the street from each other than they do when they're isolated. So that's the sort of thing that, that location brings to bear. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna skip manufacturer, that probably doesn't apply. Um, utility company, right? So what's the probability that a contractor damages a gas line while digging, right? So these are, you know, so gas leaks are, uh, have the potential to be really problematic. Uh, very near, near to my town, um, there, were, there was a situation where overpressurization of gas lines created, I think, 25 or 30 houses exploding as a result of issues with the delivery of natural gas. Absolutely, and if you think about location intelligence in that way, uh, knowing where new neighborhoods and new houses are can be very beneficial, right? So knowing the age of the, of the properties in a particular area gives you an indication of the age of the infrastructure in that area, and that's, that's just... That's so, so, Dan, from that perspective, um, so I buy data from Pitney Bowes, right? And, I, and I, I combine it with my data, and I solve a problem, and I go on, like, how, how does that get updated? Like, who updates it? Do I have to do it? Do you do it? Like, how does that work? That's fantastic. For, so, mo for most of the data that we provide, we get updates from... We're, we're essentially a data aggregator, right? We have some unique data, but we also bring together data from many, many different sources and, and build a best of breed record for whatever data set we're talking about. If it's demographics, uh, we update that every month. So essentially you get a monthly update, uh, easy to, it's, it's essentially a binary replacement in your environment. You can simply replace 
the entire file and, and move on. So it's all keyed the same and it's all everything keyed else? It's the same, it's ready to go. Let's talk about PBKey a little bit. What's the yeah. value of that in the business? Yeah. PBKey is a big deal, right? And it's, it's, not that it's, it's not that it's hard, right? A lot of you, I bet, have, have worked with trying to build your own unique persistent key that covers an address, right? It's not magic. Uh, essentially, we bring together 11 of the best data sources for address, 11 of the most accurate geocoding data sets for reference data. So we've got here and TomTom Tom and Navtech and Centris and USPS and a whole bunch of others. So you come to me and say, Dan, Google's better. And I say, yes it is, but we've got Google and everybody else. And we built a better record than anyone else can provide, right? So by taking that foundation, and then on top of that, taking on the responsibility of guaranteeing a unique and persistent key for every address within that, uh, essentially we're saving you the work. If that's the business you're in, then we're competitors, I don't wanna to talk to you anymore. But if it's not, then I can provide some real value by bringing that unique persistence to, to every address that you deal with. One more, one more use case here. Mortgage bank, what's the probability that the mortgage is going to default or be prepaid? Yeah, see, that's, that's another one. You don't even have to look at, necessarily look at the person that, that took out the mortgage, right? There are indicators in every neighborhood. Again, they're really based on the economic vitality of a particular region, um, and, and more importantly, things like, uh, what, are you, in, are you in Houston? Are you on the coast? Have you sustained, what, seven? thousand year floods in the last 15 years. There's a lot of other information you can bring to bear to help understand who's walking away from their property and who's not. And, and I think the real benefit of this is not the individual question. The, the benefit of this to business is looking at this problem at scale, right? So thinking about it on a, on a nationwide or even potentially a worldwide basis. Like, so when you're starting to think about I, I have a business and I want to, so one of our customers is the largest property and casualty insurer in the United States. And they, they just acquired sort of much of the, the address fabric and, and property information from Pitney and they, they couldn't be more excited because they've been trying to build this unique persistent key and the fact that Pitney can bring that, that conversation to the table and deliver, to that, deliver, that, deliver it to them in a way that they can then integrate it with their existing systems, they're, they're pretty excited about that. All right, um, we've got a few more minutes here for questions. No? I don't think so. No, I've <laughs> talked too much. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you very much for the noise. Yeah, absolutely. Dan and I, uh, we can be, we'll be outside. If you guys have any questions, happy to, happy to chat a little bit.